Not long ago, I was speaking with one of my Muslim friends, and he asked me a very pointed question. He said, why is it that God's son had to be tortured on a cross in order for you to be forgiven of your sins? And he went into it and started to explain more. He said, it's like he referred it to it as this bumper sticker Christianity, where Christians just, just say things like, Jesus died on a cross for my sins. And he said, it's like they've never thought about that because that's actually weird. Why would God have to die on a cross to forgive sins? He says, if you sin against me, I just forgive you and no one has to die. And he says, Allah is like that. And he said to me, that makes him better than the God you worship. And it was a very civil conversation, trust me. But he said, that makes him better. He can just forgive. Nobody has to die for him to forgive. Help me explain this. Now let me put you in that position. What would you say? Why did God's son have to be tortured to death on a cross for your sins to be forgiven? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. So first of all, okay, rhetorical, but thank you. That's, that's right. <laughs> so first of all, there's the theological answer, which we're going to get to today, and that's part of it. Part of my heart for each of you is to be able to understand just the biblical and theological realities of the crucifixion of Jesus, but I also want to take it a step further. I don't want you to just understand it theologically because the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they could understand and communicate theology very well, but they did it with a heart that wasn't moved by the beauty of the truths that they were sharing. It's important that we don't just know truth, but that we have hearts that love the truth. And so my heart for you today, yes, is to understand the deep intricacies of the beauty of the central tenet of our faith, Christ crucified, but to be able to understand it and even communicate it in such a way that your heart is dazzled by the beauty of Christ crucified. Because that's really what beauty is. Beauty is that which dazzles the heart. And so I just want to ask you, is your heart dazzled by the beauty of Christ crucified? On the surface, there should be nothing that's beautiful about a crucified man, but through eyes of faith, is your heart dazzled? Is your heart moved? Because how can we expect this world to be moved by the beauty of the truth that we share if our heart isn't moved? Are you distracted? Have you just kind of forgot? Have you just kind of accepted that truth and moved on? Is it just kind of bumper sticker Christianity to you? Jesus died for my sin. I mean, is it just kind of, or maybe it's like I moved past the cross and now I'm into the deeper things of the spirit. The apostle Paul says, I preach nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Is your heart moved by it? And so today we're going to talk about both sides of this. We're going to talk about the theological realities and meanings of the crucifixion. I do want your mind to, to fathom the depth of this truth, but I also want your heart to be wrapped around and wrapped up in the beauty of our Savior being crucified for our sins. I want both of those to come together today. David mentioned a little bit earlier that this is Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode in on a donkey uh, uh, into Jerusalem, and he was coming in during Holy Week, during the Passover feast week, uh, in order to be crucified on the cross. And so I thought it would be fitting for us to have a sort of, almost like an extended meditation upon Christ crucified, and that what, that's what today is going to be a little bit like so, uh, so if you open your Bibles, if you have them, if not, we'll have the words up on the screen, but we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew 27, and this is Matthew's telling of the crucifixion of Jesus. There are four accounts of Jesus' crucifixion in, our, in, the, in the four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew chapter 20, <coughs> 27, verses 45 through 54 and what we're going to see in this passage are five miracles associated with the crucifixion of Jesus. We're going to talk through those miracles. So let's begin in verse 45. Now Jesus is already on the cross at this point, and it's the sixth hour, which means it's noon. So the first hour would have been 6 a.m. So it's noon. Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. So now from the sixth hour... 
There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, so from noon to 3 p.m., And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. The actual word for that is that he shrieked. He said, Eli, Eli, lama lema sabachthani. That's Aramaic. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. It was an old prophecy from the Old Testament that they were referring to. Verse 48, and one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. This would have prolonged his life and therefore his suffering. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. And the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. When the centurion, that is a Roman soldier, one who oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus, when the centurion and those who were with him Keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. So I mentioned the five miracles, and here they are. I'm going to list them for you, and then we'll walk through them. There was the miracle of the darkness, the miracle of the earthquake, the miracle of the tearing of the veil, the resurrection of the saints, and the salvation of the centurion. So let's walk through each of those, and I'm going to treat the first two miracles together because each of these miracles communicates something. Matthew's not just reporting facts like a newspaper article. The miracles have a meaning, and understanding that meaning will help us understand the theological implications behind this as well as have a heart that's moved by the beauty of what's described. And so the first two miracles, the darkness and the earthquake, have the exact same meaning. And to understand that meaning, you have to go back to throughout the Old Testament, that part of the Bible that was written before Jesus was born, and see what earthquakes and what darkness represented when they appeared throughout the Old Testament. And do you know what they represented? Do you know what they communicated? Judgment. The miracle of the earthquake, the miracle of the darkness together represented judgment. And I could read through a number of verses in the Old Testament, but I'm just going to choose one passage because it mentions both the trembling and uh, or the trembling of the earth, the, earth, the earthquake, mentions both that and the darkness in conjunction as a prediction of what will happen when the Messiah comes, the Christ. This was written 800 years. What I'm about to read you, it's Amos chapter 8. It was written... 800 years before Jesus ever came, Amos was a shepherd turned prophet, and he prophesied a coming day of judgment, and I'm going to read those verses to you. Let's just uh, pull those up on the screen. Amos chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. It says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God. Okay, that's verse 11. Can we go back a couple? I said it so authoritatively, though. Okay, verse 9. You're going to make me turn there myself. I'm there, no worries. Verse 9, it says, um, And on that day declares the Lord, listen to this. He says, I will make the sun go down at noon. Okay, gosh, I'm kind of thrown off here. I actually should have started in verse 8. We're going to go backwards. Y'all are with me, right? You're with me? You're with me. Good. Verse 8. It says, shall not the land tremble on this account? So first of all, we have an earthquake involved, right? What does an earthquake do? It trembles the land, right? There we go. That's science. I just taught you. (laughs) 
And it says, everyone will mourn who dwells in it, and all of it rise like the Nile, referring to the land, and be tossed and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. What he's referring to is the the waters of the Nile would rise and fall, rise and fall. He's talking about a judgment that will come, the earth will tremble, and, and it will be like the tossing of the waters of the Nile. And he says, on that day, verse 9, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon. He even gives us the time that it will happen. And what time did the sun go down when Jesus was crucified? At noon. And so he predicts it. So God says, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. And verse 10 says, I will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. What feast was going on during the time frame that Jesus was crucified? A Passover feast, because Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so it was predicted that it would happen at noon. There would be an earthquake. There would be a darkening of the earth at noon, and it would happen during a feast. Now, that's quite precise for 800 years prior, isn't it? And he says, so I'll turn your feast into mourning, your songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning, listen to this, like the morning for an only son. And at the end of it, like a bitter day, Jesus was the only son of God. The earthquake, the darkness, were meant to communicate that on the cross, Jesus was judged for our sins. Now, I can imagine the bumper sticker Christian saying to me, I thought that the cross was about mercy. This is where I get forgiveness. He's merciful toward me. And I say, yes, mercy for you, but judgment for him. The judgment for our sins was upon Jesus. So to come back to that Muslim who said, why can't God just forgive? Well, God's in a very unique position as the judge of the universe. I mean, if he was just your next door neighbor, then sure, yeah, maybe he could just forgive. But as a judge, so he could forgive relationally, just forgive, but judicially, legally, I mean, what would you say of a judge who saw all these crimes? Maybe it was a murderer, and he saw it, and there was video surveillance, and it was very, very clear that this person was guilty, and he just said, you know what? I'm a forgiving judge. I'm going to let you go. How do you think the family of the murdered victim would feel about that judge? It would be a tragedy. It would be written up in all the newspapers. You'd see it on 60 Minutes. I mean, this is a terrible judge. No judge could do this. Sin had to be judged. And the way that it's judged according to the Scripture Genesis chapter 3, from the very beginning of the Bible, what we see, what God tells Adam and Eve, he says, when you eat the fruit of this tree, you will surely what? Die. Die. The punishment, the judgment for sinning against the author of life is death. And it makes sense. If you unplug yourself from God, you don't get his life, his electricity, his goodness, his anything running into you. The lights go out right? And so Jesus experienced that judgment on the cross in both forms. When I say both, I mean physical death. That's the obvious one. But death as being the penalty for for sins is not just a physical death. It's also a spiritual death. And spiritual death means to be cut off from God. So on the cross, God the Father was, uh, or God the Son was cut off from God the Father, which is exactly what you see in this verse, isn't it? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's crying out. Now, yes, he's quoting Psalm 22. We don't have time to go into that today. But in addition, what he's saying is I, I actually feel the weight of being separated from God. He knew what it was like. And, and, and just to even just begin to get a grid for how sharp this grief must have been. In Matthew's gospel, first of all, it's the only time in Matthew's gospel that Jesus refers to God, not as Father, but just as God. What it shows is, I haven't lost faith, but I have lost intimacy. It's like I can't even call you Father right now. I I feel this separation. 
And Jesus knew the pain of abandonment. And yet we never see him saying from the cross, my Peter, my Peter, why have you forsaken me? We never see him saying from the cross, my Judas, my Judas, why have you betrayed me? We never see him saying, my head, my hands, my feet, why are you in so much pain? He never complains about the pain of physical crucifixion, never complains about the pain of human abandonment because these were paper cuts in comparison with the pain of being abandoned by his heavenly father on the cross, which was the judgment, the penalty for our sins. I think most of us would agree, and some of you have experienced this before, that there is no pain in the world like to lose love. To lose love, I mean, there's no pain like it. The longer the time frame that we've experienced that love and the more deep and intimate that relationship goes, the more painful it is when it's ripped away. While Jesus was on the cross, he didn't just lose his father that he'd been connected with for 30 or 40 or 50 years. Jesus and the father have no beginning. It goes back forever and ever and ever. The infinitude and eternity of that companionship was ripped away for three hours on the cross, just like the skin on Jesus' back. That's why he shrieked. And it was an unforgettable shriek. If you read what the scholars have to say about it, what they'll tell you, even the skeptic scholars that don't believe any of the Bible, they say that part right there must have happened. Because if this was religious propaganda, you wouldn't make it up. It looks like Jesus is cracking cracking under the pressure. He shrieks. And the last word in Matthew's telling of the story, sabachthani, that Aramaic expression, the last word in Matthew's telling of the story is forsaken. The cross is utterly bleak for Jesus. I was thinking about this this week, and I was thinking about an old story that a lot of us read in our high school days, the story of Moby Dick. Anybody read that book? Moby Dick, you know, the sailor loses his leg because of the whale, Moby Dick, and he vows revenge against, and his name's Ahab, and he vows revenge, I'm going to kill this whale, and the whole story is about him chasing this whale, and finally at the end, he You know, he catches up with it, and he's trying to kill it, but it destroys his ship, and he can see that he's going under. Ahab is about to die, but he still has this vengeance in his heart, and he has this very, very famous line. This is what he says. He says, from hell's heart, I stab at thee. For hate's sake, I spit my last breath at thee, speaking to the well. Like, I'm going to go down hating you and trying to stab you and kill you. And I just think of that story against the backdrop of what our Savior did. Not just figuratively, but literally. Jesus entered into hell's heart. He suffered eternities of hells in his infinite person upon the cross. That's why he shrieked. He entered into hell's heart, and yet instead of stabbing at us, and it was our sins that put him there, Instead of stabbing at us, he let himself be stabbed. And instead of spitting at us, he let himself be spat on. And when I read the stories, and I'm just being honest with you, when I read the story of the crucifixion and everything leading up to it, it may sound strange, but this is like one of the hardest parts for me to read is when they're beating him and they spit on him. Because I can hardly think of any, any emblem of human hatred human disgust than to ball up, spit in your mouth, and to spew it on somebody's face. And Jesus just took it. There's nothing beautiful about crucifixion, but when you see that Jesus did that for you, suddenly you see the beauty of it. It's the miracle of the darkness, the miracle of the earthquake. That's number one and two. Now number three, Let's talk about the miracle of the tearing of the veil. The miracle of the tearing of the veil. I think it was verse 51 that says that there was a veil in the temple. 
And it says it was torn from top to bottom, as if to say from heaven to earth. This was God's doing. And this was no small thing. This was not like, you know, like a shower curtain. This is like a giant curtain. They say it, was, it would have been the equivalent of like seven stories tall. I mean, would you, can you imagine? I just almost want to see, like, was it, was it a slow incision? Was it just like a pew, just ripped it from top to bottom? I kind of picture it like that. I mean, this was a miracle. What's the meaning of the miracle? The first two miracles we talked about meant judgment. This miracle, the tearing of the veil, meant access. That is access to God's heart. So let me explain that. If you're a note taker, you can write down Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. We don't have time to cover that today, but it talks about the tearing of the veil in the context of Jesus' death on the cross. But for our purposes, I just want to explain to you the temple, because that's where this veil is just pictured as a curtain, a really thick and really tall curtain. That's where this was. And in Jerusalem, there was a temple and to understand the nature of this temple, uh, the temple to the Jewish people represented the presence of God. God dwelt in his temple. Didn't mean he wasn't everywhere else because God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. But he would manifest his presence in the temple. And so, uh, and, and so only the priests could go into the temple. And these curtains, these veils, they would first of all separate the inside of the temple from the outside of the temple. But then there was another veil inside of the temple that separated what was called the holy place from what was called the most holy place. And your kind of everyday run-of-the-mill priest could go into the holy place. Nobody else could but the priest, but they could go into the holy place, but then into the most holy place, and that's where the sacrifice and the sprinkling of the blood, you mentioned the mercy seat earlier, that's where that was. Only a high priest could go in there, and that but once a year. And you say, well, what was all this meant to communicate? Well, a couple of things. First of all, the fact that there was a temple showed that God wanted his presence to be with his people. God wants to be with you. He wants a friendship with you. And so the temple was sort of like God's missionary outpost on the earth saying, I want to be with you. But then the curtains, what they show is, is it's like they're saying, but I'm kind of limited in that. And that might sound kind of harsh. But what the curtain meant to show was that God was holy in the temple, and we outside the temple were not holy. And if you think about what holiness means, that the most boiled down explanation means it, it means set apart. God is set apart in his purity. He's set apart in his goodness, in his wisdom, in his power, in his everything. Like this is why we sing songs like there's no one like him. God is set apart. And whereas mankind, well, we're sinners. And so while the temple said, I want to be with you, the veil said, my, my very nature is I'm set apart from you, though, because you're not holy and I am. You see the problem this creates? And so, and so the question becomes, how do you have a friendship with a God who lives on the other side of the curtain? And there are really two possible answers to that. On one hand... God can leave his holy place from, from the temple. He can leave his holiness and his holy nature behind, and he can become unholy so that he can hang out with unholy people. That's one option. The other option is that unholy people somehow become holy so that we can be in the presence of a holy God. But you can't put unholy and holy together. That's oil and water. So either the holy one has to be unholy or the unholy one has to become holy. Which one is it? The beauty of the cross is that it's both. When Jesus tears the curtain down through his flesh on the cross, that's what Hebrews 10 tells us, the curtain symbolically is the flesh of Jesus. When Jesus dies on the cross and that curtain is torn down, the first thing that's happening is that the holy one, God, came to us, the unholy people, and he actually, this I almost sound like a heretic saying this, but this is the Bible, he actually became unholy. Jesus, the Holy One, became unholy on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, God made him who had no sin, which is who? Jesus. To become sin for us. Not just be associated with it, 
Not just kind of be around it, but become it. He became the embodiment of all sin. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him we who were sinners, who were unholy, might become the righteousness of God. So the holy one became unholy so that unholy ones could become holy. How do we reach the God who's behind the curtain? He came to us on the other side of the curtain so that he could bring us to his side of the curtain. So Jesus became sin on the cross. This is just like mind-boggling. I mean, there was a symbolism in the Old Testament when they would sacrifice animals. The priest would put his hand upon the animal to, uh, the theologians call it an imputation, to impute, to put upon, to transfer his sins and the sins of his people upon the creature so that when the creature uh, was slaughtered and they would sprinkle its blood. And it was a picture of what was going to happen with Jesus. Our sins were literally transferred to Jesus. They came upon him and he felt the defilement of the most defiling and disgusting things that you can imagine. He became the embodiment of all that so that when God judged him on the cross, God the Father judged God the Son on the cross, it wasn't unjust because Jesus actually was Sin, he was punishing sin on his son who fell on the grenade of the judgment of God. Wow. There was a, uh, I, I was just kind of thinking about this and thinking back on a, a season of my life that was, it was really hard. It was actually, it was hard for our church too. About a decade ago, and the church was going through a lot of turmoil at that time, and I was one of the pastors I think I was a youth pastor at that time, and so since I was a pastor, I was just kind of experiencing, there was a lot of relational pain that was involved. I mean, there was just a lot, and it was, it was a time frame in my life where I was very, very discouraged over kind of a long period of time, and, uh, but I remember there was this, this turning point in a moment, and it started where I woke up one morning early, and I just started to pray. And as I was praying and I was pouring out my heart to God and sharing some of my discouragement with God, I I saw this picture in my mind's eye. Call it a vision. Call it your, it's just in my imagination. But I saw this picture, and it was a picture of Jesus on the cross. But it's extremely graphic. Have you seen the movie The Passion before? It's actually more graphic than that. It was, I mean, you know, in the Passion, they even, like, put, like, the little clothing over him just to put a little decency on him, when in actuality, he was completely naked. And so I saw this picture, and there was just, like, I remember marveling at just, there was just blood everywhere. I mean, it was like, uh, I could see it smeared upon the wooden beam, and it was just dripping and falling in this vision, and, and it started to pull up on the ground. I mean, it was looked like, I mean, pardon being crass, but uh, if you've ever been a hunter and cleaned a deer before... I mean, it looked like it's a very messy process. I mean, it was just blood everywhere. And I just thought in my mind as I was watching this vision play out, like this is, this is the most precious blood in the universe, and it's mixed with filth and nastiness all over. And my heart started to get moved by it. And, and the more I, I dwelt, in all honesty, the more I dwelt on the, on the darkness, and it was very vivid, it was like I couldn't think about anything else. It was just there. But on the darkness that Jesus was going through, this, this light began to glimmer inside of my soul. And I can actually go back and look at my prayer journal later and see how they started to shift after that moment. Well, I, I wrote a poem at that time about the vision, and it doesn't even have a title because I never intended to read this to anybody. But I'm going to read it to you. It's pretty short. But I think it'll capture what we're talking about. You ready? It says, there he bled upon a tree, down it flowed for you and me. Dripping down to dirt below, he freely spilt eternity. Smeared across the wooden beam, gushing from his side a stream. Mixed with sand and rock and filth, and sinners' hearts he would redeem. Heaven's best amidst the worst, the one who bled became accursed. For sinners, cynics, you and me, that all should drink and none should thirst. There's nothing beautiful about that picture I described until you realize that that's actually what Jesus did for you. 
and he did it so that you could have access to the Father's heart. That's the miracle of the turning of the veil, tearing of the veil. So we've got the darkness and the earthquake and the tearing of the veil. The fourth miracle is probably the weirdest. It's weird. And it's the resurrection of the saints. It happens in verse 52 and maybe also, yeah, verse 52 and 53, I think, also. The resurrection of the saints. And, and this one's a weird one to me, I mean, for several Reason. So Jesus dies on the cross and the tombs open. Tombs are just like opening. Maybe it was associated with the earthquake. We don't know for sure. And the saints, like I'm picturing like Abraham and Ruth and Zechariah and Jeremiah and all these Old Testament saints that we read about in the scripture, they come out of their graves and they go into Jerusalem and just start hanging out with people. I mean, I'm picturing like, like zombie apocalypse here. It's like, I, I wonder if they ate anyone's brain. But they're, so they're going into the city and they're just appearing. And I'm like, there, this is like two verses. Like we could have used way more detail on this, Matthew. <laughs> tell me about the zombies. But he doesn't tell us very much. And he's the only gospel writer that tells us this story. So the question is, what's happening here? What's happening here? Well, the first thing that's happening, and this is just the, the kind of simplest, because uh, like I said, there's multiple things happening here, but one of them is this, and what, what Matthew is showing us is that there is no resurrection without crucifixion, because it was associated with, originally with the crucifixion when Jesus breathed his last. There is no resurrection without crucifixion. It's like that song that we sometimes sing, that the cross has overcome the grave. Jesus put death through death, or he put death to death. Jesus, through his death on the cross, conquered death. And so, so this is part of it. And, and it's not just that he did that for himself, not just that through his crucifixion he became resurrected, but through his crucifixion, all of God's people become resurrected. That's part of it, a big part of it. But it actually goes further, and it goes deeper than that. Because if you, if you pay attention and just read closely to what the text says, Matthew seems to emphasize the physical nature of the resurrection. He says, the bodies of many saints, that is Old Testament believers, the body of many saints came out of the tomb. It's like he's trying to say, guys, this wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. And a whole lot of people believe that there's really no physical resurrection, that we just spiritually go to heaven and have a spiritual existence for, forevermore. But that's not the teaching of the Bible. It's actually a physical resurrection where we have physical bodies. And so, and so why, the question becomes, why is this important to Matthew? Why is, he, why is he talking about and emphasizing even the physical nature of the resurrection? And to answer that question, we have to understand something about Matthew's audience. You know, Mark, when he wrote his gospel, he was writing to Gentiles, but Matthew, when he wrote his gospel, he was writing to a Jewish audience. And who did the Jewish people consider to be their father? Father Abraham had many sons. Father Abraham. And Abraham was given a promise. In fact, he was given this promise multiple times over and over again. And the promise was what? Well, it was multiple fold. I'll just read you uh, the, one of them. Math, or Genesis 17, 8, it says, this was one of God's promises to Abraham. You're going to see how this plays into resurrection in a moment. He says, and I will give to you, Abraham, and to your offspring after you, the land of your sojournings, that of, of your pilgrimage, of your travels. I, Abraham, I'll give you and your offspring all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Let me ask you, was this promise ever fulfilled in Abraham's life? It was not. Abraham died, and God had not yet fulfilled his promise to Abraham. Because it doesn't just say your offspring, it says to you, Abraham, I'll give this land. And it's very detailed. It's not like some people try to spiritualize this and like, eh, you know, it's not like the real land of Canaan. No, he's like, explore the north, south, east, and west. I'm going to give you from that river to here. I mean, it's very detailed. I'm giving you this land and your offspring. Did his offspring ever get the promise? Yes, ish. And I would have to emphasize the ish because even under, even under King Solomon, they never saw the fulfillment of the fullness of the land promise. 
They never saw it fully realized, and thus, prophet after prophet after prophet throughout the Old Testament keeps saying, guys, you're going to get the physical land. God's going to come through. We're going to get the land. Just like he said, he told Abraham, we're going to get the land. We're going to get the land. We're going to get the land. And he kept saying that. And so Jewish people, they're like, still don't have the land. I mean, we're in it. There's a bunch of Romans here, and they're ruling over us, and they're not very nice. And you say, well, what in the world does this have to do with resurrection? Okay, now we're ready. I'm going to take you to one more prophet, one of those prophets who prophesied about the land. His name's Ezekiel, and Ezekiel has this very famous passage. It's a vision. Uh, People call it the Valley of Dry Bones. There's a bunch of dry bones that he sees, and it's a resurrection passage. And uh, and I'm just going to read you what God says to him as he's having this vision. Ezekiel 37, verses 11 to 12. Here's what it says. It says, Then he, God, said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord your God, Behold, I will open your graves. Doesn't that sound a little bit like Matthew's story? I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and get this, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. What's happening here is God is saying, not even physical death can break my promise that I first made to Abraham. I told Abraham, you will inherit the land, and you will inherit the physical land. You will receive a physical body, and you will live here. And Ezekiel tells us it will happen after the resurrection. And all the Jewish people will inherit that land. You say, well... I'm not Jewish, and I, and I don't know that I'm really that excited about living in Jerusalem. I mean, it's kind of cool. I wouldn't mind visiting, but I like Hearst. If you keep reading through the Old Testament, you see that God expands on this original promise. In fact, it's Palm Sunday, right? If you go back and you read Zechariah chapter 9, here comes your king riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday. Jesus fulfilled that passage, riding into Jerusalem to be crucified. But if you read in Zechariah 9.10... Like the next verse, it says something about this king. And it says that this king will rule not just over the land of Israel, but it says from sea to sea. You know that idiom that we have, from sea to shining sea? It doesn't come from the song. It actually comes from the Bible. They got it from the Bible. (laughs) From sea to shining sea. And it says to the ends of the earth. So God begins to expand on the promise because our God is an overachiever. And it wasn't enough to give them that land. He says, I'm giving you the whole earth. And in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, God, sa- it's, God says of Abraham, it refers to him not heir of Israel and that land, but it refers to him as heir of the world, the whole world. And that's why Paul says to the Corinthians, is not everything yours? The whole world is yours. We are heirs of the world. Even if you are not ethnically Jewish, Okay, if you have faith in a or faith in Abraham, if you have faith in God, you are a child of Abraham, and according to the scriptures, you will inherit the earth. The Bible calls this the new heavens and the new earth. This is our eternal home. It is physical. It's sort of like an updated Garden of Eden, but way better. And it's total paradise. We will be physically resurrected so we can inherit our physical home. And so if you put this back into the context of the cross, what you see is that Jesus literally lost everything down to his clothes so that you could get everything, so that you could get everything, including the whole world. You're an heir of the world. And when you see what Jesus lost so that you could gain what you will one day gain, you realize how beautiful it is what Jesus went through. So let's look at one more miracle. I'm going to briefly kind of mention this one. And this one is the salvation of the centurion. Do you know what a centurion is? A soldier. The salvation of the centurion. And this one seems on the surface to be like the least incredible, right? Like, wouldn't you want to be there when the seven-story tall curtain rips from top to bottom? And you're like, eh, guy got saved. That's pretty cool. Kind of happens in my church sometimes too. But I think an argument could be made that this is the most incredible miracle of all. Let me illustrate. Can you think of anybody in your life 
that you've tried talking sense into, and no matter how much you try talking sense into them, and you're trying to encourage them to follow God, you're trying to encourage them to make godly decisions, they actually make the complete opposite decisions, and it's like you can see, like, no reasoning breaks through to them, and you can see the slow train wreck that's happening, and it just breaks your heart. Have you ever seen that happen before? I think we all have. Well, here's the message. I think it's easier for God to split the rocks and to tear a curtain in two than it is to soften a hardened human heart. And when you look at this centurion, this would be the hardest of hearts. This was the guy who oversaw the torture of the Lord of the universe. He, over, he was a professional torturer. And in addition to that, he was a Gentile, which to a Jewish mindset, that meant you were like the scum of the earth. I mean, this guy was hardened, and yet in Matthew's gospel, the first person outside the original 12 to call Jesus is the Son of God is that centurion. This is a miracle that speaks to us of a salvation that extends to everyone, not just Jews, but Gentiles, not just your goody two-shoes, but the most hardened-hearted person on the planet. So next week, we've been talking about Easter, and more people are going to be at church across our nation next week than on any week of the year. And with that as a backdrop, I just want to ask you, are there any centurions in your life? Is there anyone in your life that you could invite to church, one of those people that their heart is so hard and their mind is so hard they won't receive any amount of reason and maybe you've thought in your head, I can't imagine this person ever gives their life to Jesus. Can you think of somebody like that? The miracle of the centurion reminds us that those are the very people that Jesus died to save. And if a professional torturer could look upon the mangled and disfigured and bloody corpse of a carpenter from Nazareth and have his heart moved by the beauty of it, then number one, you could certainly have your own heart moved and dazzled by the beauty of the one who took your judgment, tore your veil, gave you the world, and softened your heart when you were that centurion. But number two, Number two, for sure, God has the power to soften the hearts of the centurions in your life. Let's pray.